Women in the Arts. My name is Milani Douglas, and I'm the Director of Public Programs here. I am so honored to feature this program um, with Celeste Beatty. Celeste, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here for another Brews and Views. Thank you. I'm glad that you're here. And I would love for you to just, uh, first, for those who do not know, let us know exactly who you are and then um, let us and get us into the panel. Yes, my name is Celeste Beatty. I'm the founder and brewer for Harlem Brewing Company in Harlem Brew South. Uh, very excited to uh, be a part of this amazing collaboration with the Museum for Women in the Arts. I make beer and uh, beer leads to great conversations like the one we're gonna have this evening. Great, um, I'm Adriana. Um, I work at the National Museum of Women in the Arts along with Milani. I'm the director of retail operations um, and oversee the museum shop and uh, product production. And we and also have, uh, uh, sorry about that guys. Um, thank you, Adriana, I got a little lost for a moment. Um, we. <laughs> Adriana just spoke. Thank you for that. Um, we also have with us Nicole. Hey, Nicole Franklin. I'm a filmmaker, storyteller, podcaster, and a longtime friend of Celeste and love that beer she has. So <laughs> the culinary arts being featured with the National Women's Museum here of the Arts. I, um, I'm all for it. Take it away, Mimi. We have Mimi uh, here with us as well. Alrighty, I am Mimi Evans. I'm the owner of Mixin' Mimi Mixology, which is a mobile bartending and event staff and uh, agency. I also own Life Gives You Lemons, which I'll talk about a little later, and Bad Moms Entertainment. And today I'm representing Chocolate City's Best. I, I had a chance to connect with them two years ago when I competed. Um, that was like the second competition that I, that I ever entered in. I was nervous, but it was a lot of fun connected with some amazing people. So I'm excited to be here today. So thank you for having me. Uh, Celeste, should I just jump right into what we have? Jump going right on today? In. Awesome. Okay. So it's Brews and, Brews and Views. So I'm going to start with my brew uh, cocktail and it's called the Awakening. So this cocktail, you can do it in whatever glass you prefer. I have a nice little beer mug here. Um, I also have one that had a handle. I thought I was going to use that, but this is cool. So if you do have the recipe, I'm going to up the counts and I'll walk you through how I do that. So I'm going to use my Harlem Brewery Lager, which I pre-poured. I have a grapefruit and I, you just use a ruby red grapefruit. Um, if you have a preference on grapefruit, you can just do the standard grapefruit juice. You can also squeeze your grapefruit juice fresh if you like that. That gives it a little bit of a better taste. Um, I have a ginger syrup. So the ginger syrup, if you're going to make this on your own, all you do is one part water, one part I use organic cane sugar and cut, dice up some uh, ginger, pop that in uh, into the, on the stove, let that cook for about five minutes, cool, and then you'll have a nice ginger syrup. All right, so really simple recipe. We're gonna hold off on our, hold off on our beer. That's what we're gonna add last into our glass, but I am gonna shake this. So I do wanna add two ounces of my ruby red grapefruit juice, about a quarter of an ounce of my ginger syrup. And I'm gonna add just a little more, like mine's sweet. And I had a cardamom bitters that I really like to use for this, but don't have my cardamom bitters. Another good substitute for your bitters, this is the standard spice bitters. So with this, it's got some cardamom, some allspice, all those flavors is gonna really help kick up our lager that we have going in here. So I'm just gonna do about three to five dashes. I can give this a shake. And I wish you guys could smell what I smell. Right now, I smell that those bitters, that grapefruit juice. Really nice. Awesome. And I'm going to top my glass off with some ice. I usually add in my ice towards the end of making my drink. Because if I'm going to talk like I do, I'm very wordy. I, I like to talk all the time. So if I'm doing that, I don't want to water down my drink. So then I'm just going to go on top with my lager. And I have a really 
nice grapefruit peel here that I'm gonna drop in. Quick thing I wanted to show you guys, one fun thing I'm doing when I'm garnishing sometimes, when I have a peel, I have your standard shears that you might see in sewing or, or anytime you're dealing with fabrics, but these have a nice, fun, rigid edge. And I just go around and I hope you guys can see. And that's what I did to get my, my ridged fruit. And I just cut the edges and it gives me a nice, fun, fun looking peel. So I dropped that in and I'm gonna go on top with some mint as well. All righty. And this is my awakening cocktail. Called it that because of all the things that you have going on in here. This is actually one that's really nice in the morning time. I drink it in the morning time. Um, your mint's gonna wake you up. All those things that are in here are refreshing. So this is the Beautiful. awakening. That is wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Uh, all amazing. right. So if you have any questions about that, I'm just gonna dump and move everything for my next cocktail, but feel free to ask me any questions. So we're clear to have beer in the morning then, is that what you're saying? You <laughs> say, according to me, if I have to, if I'm the one advising, then yes, you are clear to have beer in the morning. That's the all message right. I got. <laughs> all right, let's see, let's see, okay, cool. So the next drink that I'm gonna do is called Tomorrow's Serenity. And it's a drink, throughout COVID, I've had a lot of things going on. So a lot of the cocktails and beverages, non-alcoholic cocktails that I've been making, I've been all about making things that make you feel good, um, making things that's refreshing, sort of moved away from just mixing just the mix. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, again, in going through COVID, you look at life a little differently. So this one is called Tomorrow's Serenity. And I'm going to use a pear spice pear cordial. And this is this is a really good uh, seasonal cocktail. So I wanted to throw one in there if you're mixing along with us. That's good for this season. So this is a spiced pear cocktail. It also has some nice apple notes. So it's similar if you've ever had like an apple cider or a, a cider cordial or apple cordial. It tastes like that. So we have that going in. And then I have a cha latte. And if you're making this fresh, uh, you just brew black, blue, uh, brew your black tea, add some cloves, some cinnamon, some gingers, all your spices in there that you like. And I, I have a little bit of everything in the chai tea. Wow. And then I have a vanilla oat milk. Then moving away from my creamers. So I use things like uh, oat milk, rice milk, things like that. So this is my vanilla oat milk. And I have an orange blossom. Uh, water that I'm just going to spritz on top at the end. All right. So this is a low ABV cocktail. This one is not super strong. It's not going to get you messed up. Again, I, I'm, I'm an advocate for drinking in the morning. <laughs> so we're just going to do an ounce of the pear spice cordial. I'm going to do two ounces of my chai latte. Mm. And this can be made warm. So again, perfect for this time of the year if you like warm beverages. This is one that you can serve cold. I'm gonna serve it cold today. Um, and I'm gonna serve it uh, up. But if you want it warm, you can also warm this up. And just a quarter ounce of my vanilla oat milk. And I'm gonna serve this in my coupe glass. I have a fancy looking coupe glass, but this is gonna be the best one for this because we're not gonna serve it over ice. Alrighty. I'm just going to strain that into my coop. It's beautiful to look at. Yeah. And I'm going to garnish here with a cyclamen flower. Sometimes I do it with lavender. Uh, I'll pick the lavender seeds and pluck it around and put it around. Sometimes I do it with a cyclamen flower. This is also known as like the flower of happiness or the flower of love. So this is one that I really like to add onto my cocktail. And then I just spritz it with orange blossom water because when you pick that up, it's gonna have a really nice fragrance. Wow. That's the first thing that you're gonna taste that's gonna be on 
on the palate. So when you're making a drink, I try to make sure that it appeals to all your senses. It looks good. It tastes good. It smells good. It actually feels good in your mouth. So that, I hope you guys can see that. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. All righty. I have a quick question. What are the notes on that flower? Like, you know, you said you would might use uh, lavender, but is it, is, are there any other notes to it that? Yeah, so you know what? And that's why I went in with the orange blossom water because mm. this, this particular flower doesn't have a strong fragrance. It doesn't have a strong nose. So when you pick it up, I mean, it still smells good. Smells good because you have that chai in there and that smells really good in the net, that pear. But I wanted a little bit more. So I did go in with orange blossom water just to pull those, those floral notes in onto the nose. And is that a native flower to the area or how did you? It's not, it's just one of, it's just one of my favorites. I like how it looks in it and it, and it looks, there's so many different versions of this flower, but this particular one, I really, really like. I like how it looks. I like that it's the flower of love and the flower of happiness. Yeah. So it's one I substituted really quickly for my lavender, lavender, but lavender would have been the best one to go in and uh, complement the ingredients that we have in the cocktail, for sure. That is beautiful. Thank you. All right, last but not least, so now for my non-drinkers, uh, we have a mocktail that we're gonna do. And as I mentioned, when I introduced myself, I own a company called Life Gives You Lemons. This was a company that I started in the pandemic when everything slowed down for events because that's what we do. Prim I do primarily, I work events and staff gets hired for that. So when that completely slowed down, I had to figure out the pivot. I know you guys are probably tired of hearing that word by now, but I had to pivot. <laughs> Um, and I created a company that makes lemonades, organic lemonades. The trick to this and the fun to this and what makes us a little different, hope you guys can see it, is that our lemonade sparkle. Ah. So they are glittery and sparkling. It's a, it's a vegan friendly um, organic um, uh, glitter that we use. And I ordered from a company that's not so far, Snowy Cocktail. So if you ever want cocktail glitter, this is where it's. <laughs> I get this from. So I'm going to show you guys how I make our guava strawberry lemonade and how it looks in the glass. And I just have a standard Collins glass here. You can get whatever your favorite glass is for this. So for the sake of time, I've already made up my lemonade. My secret recipe, lemons, water, and organic sugar. <laughs> so that's my recipe for the lemonade. So this is just the lemonade pre-mixed. Then I have some guava nectar that we're gonna go in with. Mm. And the strawberry syrup also made this. So fresh strawberries, I blend them up, add more organic sugar, cook it for about 10 minutes, let it cool, strain out all of the strawberry seeds and all of the residue from the strawberry. And it gives me this really nice strawberry syrup. All right, so I'm gonna go in with about two ounces of lemonade, three. I'm gonna add half an ounce of my guava nectar and half an ounce of my strawberry syrup. And then I'm just gonna sprinkle in this glitter just a little bit. Don't need a lot, cause about a fourth of this would give me a five gallon batch. So if you're ever using this, is a one ounce bottle. So if you're ever using this, you don't need a lot of glitter. If you put in a lot, it's just gonna look like a super sparkly, over sparkle cocktail. Take this just a little. And I'm gonna go with the ice. Strain that in. Wow. And a lemon wheel would have been a great garnish for this. I don't have any lemon wheels, so I'm gonna add some more mint. When in doubt, add mint. And I don't know if you can see that sparkle. Beautiful. Love the color. Awesome. It is beautiful. And that's it. So this is the immunity. And this is what, like I said, what it looks like when it's in the store. So this is the immunity, the awakening, and tomorrow serenity. Very festive. That is awesome. Thank you, Amy. Thank Where's you. Awesome. Yes. Where, can we, where can we buy um, some, of, some of that? When life oh, good question. So uh, we're in three stores. Uh, in a store... Uh, a smoothie shop called Spizzy, 
and they are in Camp Springs and Brandywine. Uh, that's Maryland. They just opened their second location. So we're in both locations. Uh, a Caribbean uh, spot called Jerk at Night. And they have a spot in DC and they just got open a spot in Baltimore and uh, Zumo and Serenata in DC. They, had, they carry our mini size bottles. And how does everyone connect with you uh, on Instagram and Oops. social media? Yeah, so Instagram, uh, at Mix and Mimi, well, at Mix and Mimi on everything, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook. So it's M-I-X-I-N-M-I-M-I. Uh, mixing without the G as I describe it. Uh, life gives you lemons is life gives you lemons underscore us on Instagram. Uh, my personal page is Barmy Mimi. Awesome. All right, thank you. A lot of great cocktails to think about uh, for the upcoming holidays for sure. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you, Mimi, for those amazing cocktails. Uh, we're looking forward to making them and certainly finding all of your amazing products uh, for the upcoming holiday season and beyond. Thank, Thank you so much. Awesome. Great. So we're going to get geared up uh, with these great cocktails. If you've made them at home or wherever you are, uh, we're going to start uh, this great conversation tonight uh, with Nicole Franklin. And we also have from the museum, our amazing director of Retail, Ms. Ragalato. I've been working on the pronunciation of that. Um, hey, that was a that was a perfect I got pronunciation. So good, good, good job. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, let's just dive right in. I, I want to just share a little bit of background. Uh, I've been reading up about your work um, as the retail operations uh, director and wholesale at the Museum of Women in the Arts and. Uh, as Nicole mentioned, we have some history that goes back some 15 years around uh, the film space. You know, both of these spaces, retail, film, they all connect. And I, I just uh, wanted to uh, mention that a little bit. Um, I reached out, Nicole, by the way, to uh, Huggy Bear, uh, who was the star of our- Huggy Bear. <laughs> yes. So he may be out there watching. He told me to give you his regards. And I just have such fond memories of, of, of that 12 hour experience we had with all the artists and creativity, people from the community. There was such an engagement of connecting people to that art form. And I know that uh, quite a bit of time has um, gone by and now you're in uh, radio and doing these incredible things. What can you share with us about what you've been up to, uh, especially during <laughs> the pandemic and, and what's going on uh, right now? Oh, since our commercial, <laughs> um, that was a fantastic day. I do want to go back to that day. Um, we did a commercial for Celeste Harlem Brewing Company, Sugar Hill Golden Ale. And we're basically introducing it. Now, people had already been in love with it, right? But this was to make it broader out to the world. So uh, Huggy Bear, Antonio Fargas, being a celebrity helps when you do projects. You know, if you can grab an A-lister, um, even down to the D-listers, but, you know, to have this um, star from our vintage uh, TV viewing was fantastic because he's a fantastic person. And I understand a friend of yours, uh, Celeste, who's happy to be there. So basically we had a one day shoot, very shoestring budget, but we had to bring in all the toys, you know, because <laughs> our. Beer budget. Beer oh, the budget. Beer budget. <laughs> Yeah, beer budget. And we were all over Harlem because of Celeste's theme for the beer was, you know, taste the music. So we already had the culture there and everything. But I love to say we had victory that day because we did six locations in that time. <laughs> we were just running from one to the next. And we watched that weather schedule, that forecast for like three weeks. Lorenz Grant, our producer, she was checking three different forecasts because we had a huge downpour of rain. We had outside shoots and inside shoots, and we knew exactly what time to go inside and shoot the band playing. So that was a feat. And we, and we also had lunch during that time during the rain. So if you're a filmmaker and you're trying to shoot in weather, I mean, the main thing you're thinking about is weather the, um, the, the weather, you know, rain, snow, sleet, 
<laughs> and so we accomplished a lot that day. It was a beautiful piece. And I just want to thank you again, Celeste, for that opportunity to pull the crew together. Say, let's do something fun. And it was super, super fun. Jazz and beer, you know, we couldn't pass it up. So from that time on, I mean, I've done um, more than 10 films, but I, I think I do center around um, or center on um, music, you know, and our culture. I don't try to, but it comes up a lot. So our culture and um, I do a lot of films on black women, black women's joy is what I, I tend to say. My first film was on Double Dutch Jump Rope. I ended up doing three films on that. Um, Move forward to do um, a feature, uh, to feature on a short film, because I still want to do the feature. Um, if the money comes, <laughs> that's another thing. We're always raising money um, on Bess, the original Bess of uh, Porgy and Bess. So I met Ann Wiggins Brown uh, from the Baltimore area originally and who moved to Norway. But she's the original Bess of Porgy and Bess. So I was able to introduce a number of people to her story and, um, and call her a friend. And we were able to do a very short documentary that went into the lobby of the revival of Porgy and Bess on Broadway uh, a few years ago. So that was really great to bring her back to Broadway and then have the um, audience experience, you know, all the revisions that have come uh, forward since. And yeah, doing narrative films after documentaries, because I started in documentary. So to do narrative pieces, you know, dramatic pieces um, was next and a joy. I love working with actors. And after that, we had to get into what, what we're really about, which is storytelling. So I uh, was doing a short film, uh, starting a, a documentary short just last year on a 100 year old piano teacher who had 90 students. And I thought that was so amazing. Uh, she lives in New Jersey. And I said, you know, wow, well, has she ever been filmed to my friend who was telling me about her, my friend, Pamela Morgan, who runs a festival, a women's festival in New Jersey. She says, I don't think she's been interviewed. I'm like, this is, she's still working, 90 students, great. So uh, I had her introduce us. We met and her name is Maude Carroll. And I went over to her place to interview her. She thought I was just interviewing her to see if she was worthy of interview. I'm like, no, I knew when we talked on the phone, you'd be great. <laughs> Gonna do a documentary short, you know, let's start off with the interview, see all that you've been doing in the last 100 years. So I basically just set the camera up and the uh, microphone and I said, tell me about yourself. And that led into this incredible story I was not expecting for wow. the next like four hours. And you just have gold with that, right? But basically she had this horrible, abusive childhood and music is what saved her life literally because there were many points where she could have died, you know, with the abuse. And I was not expecting any of this. So that was February, 2020. And, you know, to do a film on a piano teacher, you would get her teaching her students and then maybe follow a couple of students, see how music changed their life. But hey, February, 2020 in March, everybody had to go home. Nobody could be around a 100 year old. And I uh, was talking to Bryant Monte, who is my co-host now on a pod, on the podcast, Before You Go, we call it. And um, Bryant, uh, we're kindred spirits in that we love talking to people of that age. It's kind of like a thing. <laughs> so uh, he heard about the interview, of course, because he was like, how'd it go? And I said, it was amazing. And then when I couldn't go back and film her, we were like, well, people do have to hear it. And I said, what if we do a podcast? And he said, let's do it. And so we launched December 9th, 2020, Before You Go. And our website's beforeyougo.tv. You can see where you can catch us anywhere to get the podcast. And this past October 2nd, we launched on KBLA Talk 1580, Tavis Smiley's new radio station in Los Angeles. So we're wow. a weekly series now, interview, introducing everyone to your elders and um, hearing some stories that will knock your socks off. So <laughs> thank you for that, wow. Celeste. <laughs> thank you. So speaking of stories, uh, I want to segue into talking to Adriana a moment because you talk about film as a way to tell stories and now radio to tell stories. And I've been into all types of amazing museums and seen what they do in the retail space, how they interact with artists and all types of personalities in terms of giving them a platform. 
to tell their stories. So Adriana, tell us a little bit about what your work is all about as the director of retail and wholesale. How do you kind of use that platform in that setting to, to allow people to tell stories? Um, I guess uh, kind of all happened sort of naturally um, a couple years ago. I mean, DC has always had a very creative scene, but I feel like, the, you know, starting a couple of years ago, the DC scene was really, really thriving. Um, just like a lot of excitement in the creative areas and just new things that we hadn't seen before. Um, so when I became the director, I just um, I ended up meeting a couple people that were starting new companies or they were graffiti artists and um, being young, I was like, oh, well, like, why not just let's just, you know, do something and ended up collaborating with a lot of um, local DC artists on either custom products for the shop, which I think um, I always like the idea of kind of like a, a multi-layered product in terms of I'm collaborating with an amazing local company uh, that's women owned, but then also kind of paying tribute to the museum and the, um, you know, the foundations of it. So kind of just taking it to another level. Um, some of these artists or uh, uh, business people would come in. They're, they're all kind of artists. They all, it, was, it was funny to me, a lot of these um, companies owned by women, many people worked in the art realm previously before starting their own companies. Uh, so for example, like Stitch and Rivet, um, she used to work as a costume designer in theater. Um, and then now she just makes leather goods. Um, so it was, they all have a really interesting background in art and kind of seeing how they uh, cross uh, those intersections is a lot of, a lot of fun to see. Um, so some of them would come in and kind of react to certain artworks um, or pick out certain details from certain artworks and then make products inspired by that. Um, you know, wow. it's kind of continued to spin out. Um, now we work with not just DC artists, but also um, uh, just a, a national, like national and uh, starting to work with some international artists, um, which is a lot of fun. That's amazing. Yes. Two connecting spaces, film, uh, the space that you just mentioned with regard, regarding uh, working with different artists and, and personalities and in DC. And then also, I know when my work, uh, we meet a lot of artists and they all want to do a beer label. They want to do this, they want to do that. And like, how do you decide with all these incredible artists? How do you decide when you're learning about people's story? As you said, Nicole, a hundred years old, people that are that really live amazing rich lives there are lots of amazing stories how do you really decide how do you make how do you make that choice is it a feeling is it intuitive is it through some selection process I mean, how do you how do you do that definitely a feeling and the biggest part of it is access <laughs> so you have the access you got to go for it right and it's like oh you know my cousin's friend's husband knows so and so and he's ready to talk about such and such a part of his life and then it's like wait that part i haven't heard something like that before and hey can you introduce us yes and then you kind of go and, and do it right but yeah i think the uh spark has to be there as far as what that person's story is because now i'm uh, you know there's different ways that different stories that attract a storyteller right now i'm in the space of kind of like a biography right that's because it's really their point of view and it's what they remember <laughs> I I will go and check or we'll have somebody else on who's an expert to either validate that time period and what was going on in that part of the world and say, yes, you know, what they're saying is true. And this something else happened as well and just give you context of the time. But I with some with people of this age. 80, 90, 100 years old, I do like to give the space of, hey, if this is their memory, and even if it's off a bit, you know, we're honoring the fact that they are here to tell their version. And this is how it affected them. So there's that um, issue is whatever they were going on, especially in this country, we want to branch out to other countries, but it's right now in the United States. 
Um, and being that we're on KBLA Talk 1580, unapologetically unapolog progressive, um, it's a Black station and that the uh, creatives behind the mic are Black. We have all kinds of ethnicities and races, you know, um, on as guests. But to get that history and how race affected the, the lives of our guests, there are many, many untold stories. So we, we could be doing this for years, <laughs> you know? And again, it's their truth and to give them that space. Um, but we do have to get um, quite discerning though um, and, and do some validation, I would say, when it comes to uh, certain stories. But we haven't had too much of an issue of, oh, are they just making this up? What's so cool about this age is that they don't, you know, we'll keep it clean, but <laughs> they don't give a care, right, about who hears this secret that's been in their lives for all these years. And now it's time to tell it. And I don't care, you know, who this offends. And I'm going to say it because I've been wanting to say this for a while. And those are the kind of juicy bits that we're able to bring out as well. So it's been quite fun. Wow. That is amazing. Adrian. If you're going to ask about the retail, I mean, it's kind of yeah. what you said about um, the, the, it's funny that you brought up the, the beer labels, because I mean, I see so many interesting beer, beer labels and I always am like interested to see what artists um, are doing them. I know um, I think it was like, uh, was it Bombay it was also had a, a list of artists that were doing their thing. I know DC Brow also had an artist that were doing their thing and, and seasonally they'll have competitions which might actually be the easiest way to select uh, for, for that. Because as you said, there's so many amazing artists um, with such different styles. Um, so to Nicole's point, I, I would agree. It's like kind of a feeling and kind of organic. I mean, there's so many amazing artists on Instagram or Behance. There's so many um, platforms where people are sharing their artwork. Uh, so honestly, it is, it, it is super hard to choose. Um, we obviously, or I like to like a lot of the past um, collaborations we've done, I've just gone to accidentally know people. I've either run into them or, you know, have seen their work and then kind of really enjoyed it. And it just kind of naturally fell into place. Um, but going forward, we are being extremely, I mean, again, so many people to pick from. We're being so conscious of, of, wanting different art styles um, and, and different stories, different um, art, artists with different life experiences, um, because I, I feel like the artwork um, that they create is so inspired by their own personal experiences. Um, I was just having a conversation with someone we collaborated with recently, um, Michaela Sianci, and she uh, remember she was talking about a, an, a Wizard of Oz book that she remembers when she was from a child and like how those images still kind of stayed in her brain. And obviously they've kind of influenced her work now as, as a grown adult. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of organic. I can't say we have a, a very rigid form of selecting right at this current moment. So you're undergoing two years of amazing renovations to this beautiful space uh, in Washington, DC. Are there some exciting plans you can tell us about that are gonna reshape what you're doing with the retail space there? Um, well, right um, now, well, right, I mean, during during this time right now or when we reopen? Uh, when you reopen. When we reopen. Okay. Um, well, I guess, uh, I guess it's all kind of tied in, but um, we are more actively collaborating with artists because we have the time. We're a very small team. So now we have the time to, to do it. It's it's just a lot of back and forth, a lot of communication, a lot of, um, you know, uh, with, with product mock-ups and, and that kind of stuff. It's a lot of back and forth. So we, we have the time to do it. Um, I'm hoping to work on, um, on more products that are based on our, on our current collection right now. Um, but there's room for collaborations in that, um, in that space. Like for example, um, the Louvre partnered with Uniqlo and I, it's uh, it was it's another way of like introducing artwork to different audiences. I know that they've done it a lot with Basquiat, Uniqlo, and, and Basquiat, and perhaps a lot of people who weren't familiar with with his work now kind of are familiar with at least some unique elements of his work because they've seen it everywhere with Uniqlo. Um, 
like I know the Vincent Van Gogh Museum partnered with Vans. Um, Doc Martens also does like a really cool art collaboration as well. So, um, you know, hoping to do some bigger collaborations in that way. And then also doing that same thing, but with smaller, with smaller companies to always kind of um, encourage local sales and community. Wow. Nicole, there's a lot of different platforms out there to share all these great stories <laughs> you're creating. There's Amazon this and Apple that, and everybody has all of these big tech companies and platforms have their own media companies. Has that made things easier or have you have more options to get those stories to uh, people that want to see them or potentially? You definitely have more options, but do you have the uh, the resources? Um, what's going to be the amount of money certain streamers are willing to pay to get you on their platform? And it could be next to nothing. And so for somebody just starting out, exposure is important, right? So it's like, okay, um, and I'll include Netflix in this. I'll go ahead and say it. Um, yeah, you can upload your film to Netflix. Now you're not that big Netflix co-production that Netflix has thrown money in behind. We're talking the millions of dollars, <laughs> but you could say, oh, I'm going to, you know, use an aggregator or, uh, you know, distributor to get me on Netflix and then maybe get a couple of thousand or nothing, you know, from it. And, uh, but everybody can see my film on Netflix. When you've been in the space as long as I have, which is about three decades of <laughs> you know, doing films and seeing this evolution of, hey, can we get AMC uh, theaters to play it, which would kind of been like, you know, a few years ago, because AMC started reaching out to independent filmmakers. And that's what I consider myself as an indie filmmaker. Uh, back in the day, it's like, hey, can I get Sony Pictures or somebody to green light something I'm doing? Well, now, yes, we can green light ourselves but are, do you have a revenue stream that's going to support you putting out your work and then going to the next project? I think that's an area now where our younger uh, or emerging filmmakers and storytellers are kind of navigating. Um, us veterans are uh, have more options in that we have been through this evolution and we have already learned that hey, as a documentary filmmaker, you're going to make more money speaking, <laughs> right? Or in the academic libraries or teaching and teaching your method of how you got this done and hosting seminars. You know, there's other ways that uh, it's about getting your product out there and getting your film seen. And then if you're doing it enough and you're not giving up, then you do meet somebody who gives you the, the big payday. But of course, it's not about the big payday when you're very passionate about uh, putting uh, stories on some kind of medium, whether it's audio, audio documentaries, uh, you know, a, small, a short film versus a feature film. I now advise people to have your first piece as a filmmaker as a short, you know, um, the shorter, the better, because the production values will be there. You, would, you have more resources to put in um, those color correction days and the sound design and to really make that piece very, very special, keep revisiting it, revisiting it, adding one more layer to it. If it's 90 minutes or two hours, <laughs> you've got so much, you know, that's going to break the bank and maybe break your spirit because it's going to take a while, <laughs> you know, because you want to put out the best thing possible. But yeah, I mean, it's a whole new world out there with all of these streamers plus, um, people that are trying to get into the smaller screens, we're talking about the mobile apps and, and things like that, that um, I think it's going to be the, the next generation that defines what we're watching. Well, speaking of what we're watching, I just wanted you to know that there is a young lady that arrived from New York here into Rocky Mount, where we're filming this from. She's a filmmaker. And she told me that you were one of the people that inspired her. Her name is China Colston. She has a film on Amazon video called Dark Seed. And when I told you you were coming, she's in rehearsals right now for a play about the life of Ida B. Wells here in the city. Nice. But when 
your name. She's like, oh my gosh, she was so helpful to me. She was so inspiring to me. And I know how important that is to have someone like you and Adriana when people that are, are, are have these great ideas and creativities and products and, and art, they need to be able to hear, uh, at least have some words of encouragement. So she asked me to give you her regards. Hi, China. Yes, <laughs> we're connected. But I, uh, and, and going back to Adriana, uh, all these artists, uh, you know, knocking down doors. And I've seen some of the stuff artists have tried to do to get your attention, <laughs> whether it's you as a filmmaker or you, Adriana, as someone who is a decision maker. You have within your hands the ability to change the course of someone's life, you know, to set them on a trajectory in terms of the possibilities and opportunities to have their products, uh, their artwork at the National Museum of Art. And I know you just said that can be a really difficult and challenging uh, thing to, um, to figure out, but how do you do that? Have you had someone approach you just off the streets of DC or send works in uh, hoping to get your attention? How do you, how do you deal with this flood, flood of uh, products and, and, and ideas that people are trying to, to, to get into the museum? How does that work? Um, in terms of uh, companies that we carry in the shop, we I, I do try to carry, um, you know, a, as many as possible um, small um, local or small, just small owned companies. Um, mm -hmm. They will oftentimes um, just email their products with a line sheet. Um, and I will say that it is important to be persistent because, again, super small team. So sometimes I just literally don't get to or see certain emails, but some people who've been so persistent, like I eventually see it, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. Um, so there is something to be said about, about that. Um, in, and then in terms of, um, there's just, I go to a lot of um, uh, buying and sourcing shows. So there's like a shop object, which is a really awesome one um, that happens in New York. Um, and you know, there's just also there's tons of little fairs that are that are around now. So I'm constantly just looking for anything that's going to make me excited. Um, and obviously, it's always awesome when that comes paired with a really amazing story. Um, and I feel like small owned companies always come paired with that because it's, you know, someone who's passionate about what they're doing. Um, and they're, you know, enough enough so to take a risk to start this business. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm sure that was the same probably for your brewery. Like you love doing what you were doing. You're like, I'm going to do this and kind of taking that risk to do it. So um, I do feel like those, those local companies and the smaller companies tend to come with really amazing stories and really amazing people behind them, which kind of ties into Nicole's storytelling. It's it, you are telling a story with what you choose to carry or to, to promote. Um, sometimes I feel like obviously in this land of Amazon, we, we lose a lot of that. Um, we lose a lot of the, the, the human touch to, to products. Um, but, uh, again, I, I can't, I don't know if I can answer real well with, uh, how, how we're selecting people, but I, I am very conscious of the stories behind the companies. And you talked about, um, uh, you know, connecting with people and, and looking at the, just the broad spectrum of art and genres and all that. And, your museum is only so big. Has the digital space allowed you to include more artists? Because now you're not always talking about the physical art, but the ability to show it in all those digital ways that I'm still trying to understand. NFTs. Someone said, oh, you should get an NFT for your beer. What? What? What is that? I mean, are you finding that as all these apps and different spaces and opportunities open up that you, you are able to include more? Uh it's something that I want to explore. I mean, uh, as you mentioned with Nicole, there's so many platforms for every little different kind of thing. Um, uh, NFTs, I've that, I mean, that, that cryptocurrency uh, NFT world just kind of, it's super interesting to me and I'm very intrigued. Um, I know Sotheby's and Christie's are kind of doing that stuff. I haven't like explored this idea yet, but I've, have been thinking if it's possible to somehow do that with the retail space and collaborations. Um, because I mean, a crypto punk is worth a couple, couple million dollars now. So 
<laughs> can make the museum some money. Why not? Right. Yeah. What about Nicole? Is there any space for this non, what is it, non, I don't know, this NFT uh, application or platform? Is there any opportunities for you in the film space or filmmakers? Tons. There's tons. So I am. For the example. C for example. <laughs> well, I'm the CMO of a of an altcoin, actually. I'm in cryptocurrency. I'm a, the CMO of something called Life Crypto. So we are an altcoin and we have an NFT vault being added to our app that will be coming out in the next week or so. So <laughs> this is right up my alley. And um, I love cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency, the crypto world is for risk takers. And that's who we are as artists. So I got into cryptocurrency back in 2017. And, you know, you have Bitcoin and you have right now about 11,000 altcoins. So it's it's going to be around forever, guys. So we do have to get into it. <laughs> but you go in with warnings. It's the wild, wild west. You know, not a lot is regulated now, but you meet a lot of wonderful communities. Our community, Life Crypto, is, is terrific. But what I think is happening is that the idea of crypto from the beginning, from the get go, is always peer to peer currency. You know, we cannot let the government dominate our lives by, you know, with the economics, because there's so much they can do to take away things that we've worked hard for. So if we just kind of deal with each other, you know, why not? And I think that's kind of the vibe that started it because you see cryptocurrency helping a lot of countries and situations and communities that don't have access to um, better situations. You know, we're talking the difference between the classes, upper, middle, lower class, you know, and cryptocurrency really helps people who, are, who always get the short end of the stick, it feels like. And so I love that cryptocurrency is there for them. So there's many uh, details as to how to purchase it, right? And how to trade it and what marketplace. And, you know, we can get into all of that <laughs> another time. But I think the main thing is, that we call the shots as just regular people. We don't need a license, you know, and now um, we're developing products. So I'm excited that one of our uh, best features with live crypto, and this is going on a number of, of cryptocurrencies, is there's something called staking. And I love that because we, we understand for many people, you cannot survive or have wealth without some source of passive income. And so just like in regular banking worlds where they have a CD or a money market account, you know, sock your money in this space for three months or 12 months, and then you get 0.2%, you know, when you take it out. Well, what we're doing is we have staking and you can put your money in this digital wallet, your currency in this digital wallet, and we're giving you 39% a year. So, you know, we get to, to call that shot, you know, and say, hey, come with us. And then a number of people are saying, oh, 30% here, 10% there. But you can do that in the crypto space. And with NFTs, basically, it's digital art um, in the form of, sure, there's uh, images, but there's also books, there's movies, and um, anything that people can grab and put a blockchain, sign a blockchain address to. The blockchain keeps everybody transparent. You can always watch the wallets, tell who's done what. And basically, you can auction off your art, so to the highest bidder. And that's what's nice. So yeah, it's Sotheby's and Christie's jumping in. Yeah, they are. But now anybody can do it and make that um, make that happen for themselves. And that's what's exciting. Um, yeah, Christie's, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was just gonna say, I saw an interesting, uh, uh, I saw that the Matrix, the new film is gonna come out. And so they decided to sell 100,000 NFT avatars. Um, and I was like, oh, those things are going to sell out super quickly. Of course they are. Um, but it was one of the first uh, larger film NFT collaborations that I've, I've started to see. It made perfect sense for the Matrix because fits in theme wise. Perfect. But absolutely so fun. Wow. This is very interesting. It sounds like we're going to have to have another discussion on this uh, NFTs, cryptocurrency, the arts, how to leverage that as women artists um, as 
uh, women focused museums and institutions. Uh, I don't know all the particulars. I've been in Clubhouse and a few other places trying to figure it out, but it, it's very fascinating. It sounds like something we should all learn more about and see how we can apply that to, to, to empower ourselves. Absolutely. And while you're figuring it out, start staking. <laughs> hey, is that S T A K I N G or? It is. Got it. Okay. I think I got that one. So guys, uh, staking, Google, and reach out to Nicole. Uh, so we're rounding up our last few minutes of brews and views. And I'm wondering if there might be something you might want to share, Nicole, Adriana, with regard to what you do. Uh, we're, we're living in this mad, unpredictable world where we don't know what's going to happen. Are there any words of encouragement, something you might want to share with our audience uh, that's here with us this evening and others that will hear what we've shared uh, today. Anything you'd like to, to go out with about yourself, about life, inspiration, possibilities? Do, do you want to go, we'll go first, Nicole, or do you want me to go first? You can go first, Adriana. Um, I guess um, for me, if, if you're going to own a business or um, uh, create artwork. I think first you should start from a place of just doing it for yourself out of, out of the fact that you enjoy doing this, um, because it is, it can be a very difficult journey up and down. Um, and uh, you know, so I think to, to, to do it out of a place of love, not just out of a place to make money. Um, and hopefully most of the time when you're doing something out of, out of passion, um, you know, people tend to find you and it, you tend to find your way. Um, but to definitely be prepared for, for some ups and downs. And um, that's why to, to start out of a good place. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, yeah, oh. I, sec I second that. Um, you cannot be a filmmaker without a community. Sure, you can make a film. You can make the best film in the world. Who's going to see it? <laughs> You have to surround yourself with a community. And um, as Adriana is um, very supportive in, in what she's been sharing about working with entrepreneurs, yeah, you're only going to find people like her if somebody else is going to say, hey, you know, I met this person. I want you to meet them too. So start building those communities. There are formal clubs out there and associations, but you've got to join. You've got to be involved. And um, so I always push that to our emerging uh, talents. Oh, please join um, us at beforeyougo.tv. I got to say with our storytelling series, our podcast, Before You Go TV, I have found it extremely comforting. When you're talking to somebody who's 100 years old, they have been through this before. They've been through everything before. We are going through a pandemic. I um, have a guest from a few episodes ago who's 105 now. She's a retired nurse, but she was born when tuberculosis was taking members of her family away, you know, back around the same time of the Spanish flu. So they've been through that before, you know, and, and we're talking to survivors of just life in general. People have gone through many world wars right and de the depression so a lot of economic fallout they're still here right we went through an insurrection we're here we're learning from it but if you listen to what the elders have to say about it as well it's if anything else if you don't learn anything that i know you, you are going to it is quite comforting and um, we like to just kind of let the microphone just take it all in and, and let them just preach. <laughs> but we do ask, you know, questions, of course, but it, it, they have a lot to say and uh, check it out. I think, it, especially in times like these, Celeste, like you brought out, it's, it's really comforting and uh, just gold, pure gold. I'm honored to uh, be a part of it. Thank you for sharing that. Milani, you want to wrap it up for this evening? Oh, I just want to thank you all for joining us for um, Brews and Views and uh, looking forward to more conversations about all the things you all talked about. Um, I'm fascinated with both of you all's work on how you engage community um, around it and just also how you build community. Um, both of you are professional community builders and getting mm -hmm. it done. 
Um, and you too, Celeste. So I think that's, that's like a, a thread that goes through all of the work that we are doing. Um, but this closes out another successful episode of Brews and Views. And Celeste, thank you so much for collaborating with us on this. And Celeste, tell them where they can get, where can people get your beer? And also what's the latest, is there a latest brew? Is there a seasonal brew? What are we, what should we know? (laughs) Yeah, so if you're in the DC area, you can definitely get the beer at Fresh Market, um, right there at the DC line. Uh, We have our Queen Stout there. We will be Hopefully, within days, getting our 1946 lager, which was a collaboration uh, beer uh, that we did uh, with one of our uh, partner uh, breweries in Pennsylvania. Um, We are sitting here in our tobacco warehouse, uh, which is a historic uh, location uh, where lots of history took place around uh, rights for women, uh, African-American women on the East uh, Coast in the tobacco industry. Um, we are building out our space here so we can bring you more beer. Uh, as it has been, there have been challenges, but many opportunities. And we're most excited about the one that we have with the National Museum of Women in the Arts. I've met so many incredible people. I want to thank Nicole again, Adriana again, Milani, Amanda, and everyone that joined us this evening. We look forward to having this conversation again very soon. And happy holidays to you. Also, don't forget to look up Mix and Mimi on Instagram. Um, Make sure you check out her recipes and see what she has to offer you. Um, Happy holidays. Everyone enjoy. Have a good evening. Happy holidays. (laughs) Thank you.